Hello, guys. Thank you for having me here. It's a real privilege. Today, I'll cover the topic of uh, how to use access with serious secure bank grade APIs. Almost uh, one and a, half, uh, and a half years back, I joined 10x. 10x is a fintech company which is uh, providing banking solutions, cloud native, essentially a banking a bank operating system. So. In order to interact with this, let's say, bank operating system in the cloud, the only way is to use APIs. These are, let's say, serious, secure bank-grade APIs. So starting to, to build a mobile application for such a, you know, demands, we had to cover a couple of things. And this, I summarize here some requirements for any more than API client. And so first of all, the ability to have a persistent headers configuration, token-based authorization, authorization, uh, token expiration and refreshing, hidden potency fingerprinting, we'll get to that, and uh, multiple base endpoints. So during this slides, I will show you the code to see how we can build an API connector which can fulfill these requirements. So from now on, almost only code will be, so I hope you'll enjoy it. So how this API connector look like? Essentially, it's just a function which is returning a, a single function, and this uh, function is a get instance function. And uh, if you see the get instance, is pretty simple, and it's uh, returning just an instance if it's found based on its name, which can be the default one, so you don't have to worry about if you have only one uh, instance or you have uh, the default one. And if the configuration is provided in the get instance, then it will create a new instance. This can be used also to override the, an existing instance, obviously. So let's see how this create instance look like. As you see uh, above the line two, we have a set with, where we are storing multiple instances by name. But let's see the way to use it first. In order to use the API connector, you have the first part is the initialization. So that's the configuration and we're in, uh, getting the new instance as default. And we are providing a set of value pairs. Uh, some of them are Axios specific, like base URL, and some other are, let's say, specific to our API connector. And we're going to see the use of each of them. Also, it's very important the two flags, the auto refresh token and the use idem potency tokens, which are very important and will trigger some interceptors, but we'll see later on. So the way you use it, the, the connector once was, uh, it's, uh, it's initialized, you just straightforward using as an API or anywhere else in your code, you can call it with API connector get instance. Or maybe if you have a different, a different instance with, let's say, in the name legacy already initialized, then you can call it anywhere with a get instance of that name like legacy. So that's very use, uh, easy. The most important part is that with this API connector, you just focus on the task at hand you know, calling the host and get and whatever patch you, you, you have to do without worrying about the authentication token, the idem potency and other things. So everything else is, is happening under the hood. So we're going to see how these things uh, are done. So the first part is the create instance. We're just uh, separating the access instance from the rest of the parameters. And we're going to create uh, the headers. This is the initial and default headers for, for our uh, instance. As you see here is a very, let's say, a smart way of providing the, the headers only if the values are, un are different than undefined. Because if you provide, if you just write the, the header and the value, which is undefined, the Axios is transforming the undefined in a string name undefined, and then it will provide the, the header with a, the value undefined, which is, which is strange. The, once we have the headers, we're going to use uh, the, the factory to create the actual instance. And here we have an example of using two different factories, the original the Axios factory and the debug, debug web Axios. The debug web Axios is here just for 
to illustrate a way to use uh, the Axios factory with a specific or a custom adapter. But we're going to, to see them at the end. So here, as you probably notice, we're going to have two different instances. One is a refresh instance and one is the instance. They are looking identical. The only thing is that the instance is casted to an extended access instance uh, because we might need this kind of type later on. Why is that? Because uh, the instance uh, headers will, during, during the life cycle, will be updated and uh, will be dynamically updated. So we don't want to have the refresh instance polluted with a, let's say, specific headers from the instance. We're going to see why, why is that it's important. And once the instance is created, we're just going to add it in the, in the set of the instances to be retrieved later on. Once we have this, we are going to use the interceptor. The interceptors are very important and very powerful methods which are provided by Axios. And we have two types of interceptors, the request interceptor and the response interceptors. For the request interceptors, we're going to use two. One is the authorization interceptor and the other is the impotence interceptor. Axios is um, using these uh, request interceptors in an asynchronous way, not to, let's say, block the request. However, we want to block and alter the request. So this is why we, we force the synchronous to be true, the flag. And we also provide the run when, and we're using the flags which I mentioned in the, in the configuration, the auto refresh token and the impotency, using the impotency flag. So uh, only this interceptor will run only if, this talk, if these flags are set to true. The response interceptors, where you're using two, one is a stored token interceptor, which will be uh, called on success of the request, and the refresh token interceptor, which is, is called in, on the failure of the request. Right? So we're going to, to see each of them. So the first, the first interceptor, the authorization interceptor, essentially just adding an authorization header with a bearer and uh, the token, uh, the access token, which is stored in this uh, object, the tokens object. So this token object is stored, uh, is storing the access token and the refresh token, right? So if this access token value is present, then automatically the authorization header is added to the, to the request, to each request. So this is a way to make sure that once we have this, once the, the, we logged in and we are authenticated and get this access token, all the subsequent requests are, let's say, provided with this authorization header. The next interceptor will be in the impotency interceptor, but let's first, let's say, recall or maybe for, for those which do not know too much about this idem potency. So the idem potency is, is the, the mechanism to try to prevent repeated accidentally requests. For instance, if you want to do a payment and you get a timeout, you don't want, if you retry the payment, you don't want this payment to be done twice, right? So for that, it's important that some of the methods called, called on, on the Axios uh, to be in impotent. Now, from, from the literature, from the documentation, the, the impotent uh, HTTP verbs are get, had, delete, and put. I said put on red because there are APIs which are also not trusting put as, an, as a impotent. The put normally is used to overwrite or update an information. So if you provide it twice, it doesn't matter because you keep updating the same, let's say, object twice. But sometimes the, the put is, is used by the, the server side in different ways. So this might be a case that put might also fall in the non impotence So the idea is to provide a key, which is a unique key. And the format, the preferred format is UID before, also used, for instance, by, by Stripe. And this is this key is just a fingerprint, which is generated from the payload data, right? Like a checksum. So we're going to see how, how this is, uh, is happening. Now, the impotency interceptor, it's, it's very simple. It's just checking the, the method of the request. And if it's either post, put, or patch, it will add the impotency key from the, from the payload, from the request data, right? 
Let's see how this hidden potency key from is designed. You'll see probably here a lot of math. I'm not going to, to get into much detail. The only important thing is that the build hash, the, the function below is providing a 16 uh, bytes hexadecimal uh, string. And uh, it also provides a very widespread. So the, the chance of collision is very, is very low, uh, extremely low. And we need to have a UID, we need a 32 bytes a hexa. So, so what I used here was to first build a hash from the, the payload and the second hash was built from the previous one. So we have a pretty big um, spread here. With a response interceptor, the first response interceptor on the uh, success is a store interceptor. And this is only checking if the auto refresh token uh, flag is uh, set to true. You remember that, that flag. We're going to inspect the data. And if this data contains the access token and the refresh token, we're going to add them to the object tokens. This is, this is happening when you, for instance, do a login and you, uh, you get back the tokens for the, required, the, the access token and the refresh token, but those are in, uh, automatically you know, processed and stored in the API connector, so we don't have to worry about it. Once they, they are populated there, let's say the interceptor for the, the request interceptor will always populate access, the access header with the bearer for the, for the access token. The second interceptor, the refresh token interceptor, if you remember, it was triggered only on error, so when the, the, the call was failing. And if this call is failing, we're going to extract the status and the, the data from, from the response. And if the status uh, is a 401, which is an unauthorized recall, uh, unauthorized request, then we're going to, to uh, try to refresh the token. First, we're going to check if we already retried, and if we retried already and we failed, then we're going to fail anyway. If not, uh, we just set uh, the retry to true, and then we're going to call the refresh token. And this refresh token function, if it succeeds, we're going to retry the original instance, right? So the original instance we, which we are working with. And if it's failing, we're just going to return the, the error, right? The refresh token is, as you see, is using the refresh instance. So right now it, we, it, it makes sense to have two instances because this instance will not be polluted with any other, uh, let's say, headers, which are not uh, necessary there. And also let in, intact the, the original instance, which is used to retry the, the original request. So if the uh, refresh token succeed, we're going to receive the access token and the refresh tokens, and we're going to store them as usual. So this refresh token is also used as a helper function and along with another helper function, which is the update headers. And this update headers function is used to update in sync both the instance and the original instance and the refresh instance with additional headers, if the case. So these two headers, these two methods, the refresh token and the update headers are added to the instance. So that's the reason the, the API connector is returning an extended Axios instance as opposed to a normal uh, Axios instance because we want to have uh, access to this refresh token and update the uh, headers uh, functions. At the end, we're just returning the instance. So then uh, everything is fine. Now, because we can't uh, overlook the, the TypeScript part of, of any code in, when we're talking about React, React Native. Here is some types. So the connection uh, config is just an extension of the access request. And we have a couple of data there, like API keys, device keys, and so on. And also the two flags, which are very important. Then the obvious headers type, which is just straightforward uh, value, key value pair of uh, strings. The extended Axios, which I talk about, and it's an Axios instance extended with the refresh uh, token and the update headers. And then we have to also handle the, this uh, did retry thing, which is added in the config. So for that, we have the, the next two types. 
And at the end, we have the, the type for the object, which is storing uh, the access token and the refresh token, right? So uh, remember that we were talking about different factories. So we have the axios as a normal factory to create instances, but we want to, to see how we can uh, use a custom factory. So this is, uh, let's say, this debug web factory of axios. Let's go, uh, it was called debug web uh, axios. The purpose of this is to add the reactor tron debugging when you want to run the React uh, native uh, application in Expo in the web, for instance, right? So then you want, uh, how, uh, Reactor Tron is not able to intercept the access calls. So how are we going to do that? The normal create function is just uh, using the Axios to create a new instance, but with a different adapter. So see the before last line, and then we just return this, this line, but let's see the adapter, how we, we create a new adapter. So this new adapter is using the original HTTP adapter from Axios library, and is just intercepting the response. And if this response, and if it gets the response and the, the debugging is true, then we're going to call this function, which is debug Tron. And we're going to provide the request, the request and the response for, for that request. Otherwise, we're just ignoring it. At the end, we need to call the settle function, which is also provided by Axios to make sure that we settle the, the resolve and reject with the response. So that's a very simple adapter, but obviously you can, you can use uh, the HTTP adapter from Axios where you can build your own fetcher and uh, build an adapter within your own fetcher, for instance, if you have something like an encryption. So, uh, so how this debug Tron is is using? Essentially, it's it's calling the Reactor Tron API response for uh, a Reactor Tron API response, uh, which is line five. The, it's Tronifying. Okay, so it's formatting, it's transforming the config and the response for the understanding of the of the Reactor Tron. I'm not getting into too much details with that. Uh, I will share this code shortly after uh, this session. So we kind of uh, ended the, the, the hard part with the code. So let's, let's go th and, and remember the features of the API connector. So we maintain multiple reusable pre-configured access instances, automatically provide a dynamic authorization token, store internally the authorization refresh token, ensure automatic authorization token refresh, retry, the failed original uh, on authorization, build intent potency fingerprint for post patch input, and provide support for access factories current adapters. So, yeah, this is all. If you have questions, I'm looking forward to answer that. Thank you.